Brexit Union. Um, Timothy, and in this talk, we'll be going over the 2022 Emacs User Survey. Since this is the first time we're discussing this, we'll be going over the survey itself a bit, um, how it's been put together and run. And then we'll have a little taste of the results with more analysis to be published in the future. Start with a, a bit of background. So, in 2020, we have had an Emacs user survey run by Alien Project. Now, this is, the best my knowledge, the first time that a large-scale Emacs user survey has actually been run. About 7,000 people went to the survey, so in many respects it was quite successful. And what's significant, I think, about this is that with this being the first time that a large-scale survey has been run, it actually provided some insight into questions about how the community is using Emacs that allow for much better guesses than just speculation based on the small number of people who respond on the mailing list um, usually. So, why are we doing another survey? Well, so if you want to get the parameters value out of any Emacs user survey, it's quite helpful if the information in it is recent. Furthermore, we can actually get some more value uh, if we can examine the trends, uh, shifts in the way that people are using Emacs, where the pain points lie, what people are enjoying the most, etc. So in both of these respects, it's to a that if the survey is actually a regular event, instead of just something that's run once. Now, as with this in mind, we're running the, we're the 2022 Emacs user survey with the plan that this will actually become an annual event. In the design of the survey, there are a few goals here. The main one is of the use of the community. Now, use of the community is a rather nebulous phrase. In this case, what's made in particular is a value of questions, for example, things like pain points of Emacs, uh, which e versions people are using, um, which capabilities people are making the most use of, and which could potentially be helpful to both Emacs as well, but also our collection of Emacs package maintainers around the whole community. Uh, and actually, I think that maybe not just the packages, but you also have people who develop tutorials, guides, um, and all of that sort of surrounding activity, which can benefit from a clear understanding of how Emacs users use Emacs. Separately for that, I think, for, as part of the actually for myself, but it's rather interesting to see how the people using Emacs and what their experiences. So it's basically about utility and interest as the two separate factors. And as we're trying to pick questions which actually can get us off this without taking up too much of the respondents' time. Now, last time in 2020, the ASO and Alien Man used, I think, a Google form with my walk with an option to send in responses manually. This worked, but it's not great. Um, particularly given that this is for a survey being in an ardently false community, ideally we actually want to find a survey framework that respects the privacy of its users, is open source ideally, free and open source, and is a relatively pleasant experience. Unfortunately, looking at the other options, it seems that one always has to compromise on at least one, if not all, of those criteria, uh, which is quite far from ideal. So, What's the obvious solution? Okay, we should just write a new survey framework. Uh, obviously, this is easier said than done. I'm going to let you go actually sort of exactly this. Um, I have used the uh, programming language Julia quite a bit in my day to day basis, and there just so happens to be a web framework for that called Genie. So I thought I'd give it a shot. I will. Here we are today. I ended up putting some together which um, can take a set of questions written in Julia, um, and using a survey library actually parts it into some helpful structure of and in constructed HTML forms based on that and ingest results from the HTML forms and just sort of handle that all together. Now all of this ends up being fed into an SQRDB, so everything's only in past responses. The one of the goals with the actual design of this has been to just minimize what's actually done with client science. So that means 
uh, JavaScript cookies, the whole, basically, as far as this cookies can be taken, we have just got static HTML being shoved to a, a the user, uh, responded rather, and then we just take an HTTP post request back and update the results that way. Now, while I think things are actually paging the survey, um, we can allow for incremental saving of results and a few other niceties. While essentially preserving an experience that doesn't really require any um, JavaScript really particular capabilities, which is quite basically sort of quite a nice, clean, minimal experience as far as I'm concerned. So, how does it actually look like in practice? Well, one of the nice things about this is because the rest of itself in, 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 in Julia, we can get some nice features like custom validators. Um, and other kinds of behavior and directly specify how we actually want uh, questions to be registered in the database. So here we have, for example, two questions we had from this actually survey. One is obviously select another one is just putting in uh, the number of years people have used Emacs for. And this gives away only the capabilities. One of the things I'd like to draw particular attention to here is in the multi-select, you'll see the make options, some of which, the first one of which actually maps with different value to be stored for convenience. And then the final one is just one the other. And you can see that's a bit different to the rest, which got that common function, it's a symbol, not a string. And this is quite a nice one because what the way that this fair has been uh, designed, when we have an other value like that, instead of just being a sort of tick box other, it actually provides the option to write in your own um, set different response to one of the above. Okay, so we've made it. We've now got a completely false survey framework. Well, uh, so the survey of what were uh, these decent way to put We have to expand that word. I think we can just about the strawberries of each set. Zero dollars required, but a little bit used for best enhancement. As demonstrated, uh, we can get some fancy validation going on. And then because we've got the uh, results to try it into this quite nicely. We can actually have them available live and in quite a number of formats. I'm not sure how much you saw in the arts diagram, but we've got all sorts of things here. CSV, TSV, plain text, JSON, just have like, a copy of the SQLite database, but only the relevant bits. Uh, or something called Jerry 2, uh, which preserves a lot of type information and a few other nice things. Now, what are we going to do going forward from here? Well, I've a few more issues here. Uh, for example, there's a memory leak issue which is going on. Um, the results in the service being restarted because I think every day or two while the server is running, I actually have a suspicion that that's largely responsible for the about 1% of respondents, which is about 75 people, who describe the survey experience as not great. Um, overall, the, uh, the feedback has been quite positive. Uh, there's been some detailed written feedback, but just from the big great, okay, not great options. We had about two thirds of people saying that the user experience was great, which is really nice to hear for the first time being run. A few other things we guys for example, in future control flow, and by this I mean the option to present different questions based on previous answers, would be quite nice to streamline the experience, for example, having a set of questions for first time respondents, um, or people who are involved in the, um, Sort of package side of packaging side of things and without actually closing the experience for everybody else, that'd be quite nice. For those of this, all of this, I think on top of the standard web interface, we quite nice to actually write a server API. And uh, the particular reason why I mentioned this is because this could potentially allow for basically an Emacs server package. I mean, we already use Emacs for so many things, might as well build the server out from within it as well. Okay, so. This is how the survey is being conducted. Now, what do the responses look like? Now, this is actually hoping to get into some somewhat sophisticated analysis because there's quite a bit that you can dig out of the responses that we've received. However, unfortunately, I've been much more limited on time than I'd hoped for, so that's going to have to come later. But now, we're just going to take a bit of a peek at some of the really basic. Um, and that's as well as something really nice, as expect to see lots of pie charts, basically. Um, but that's still a bit of interest, so I'll go through with that. Um, I'll just give a bit of a tease as to what might come in the future. So, to sum up the starters, we've had about 6,500 responses. So that are, it is worth noting about thousands of those are parcels, so people who came up on the survey part way through. 
given the 2020 survey and about 7,000 ones. So that's basically on par here. It's very good month. And interestingly, about half of these respondents did not participate in the 2020 survey. I think at this point it's not really clear what to make of that. Um, there's been a two year gap between the surveys, that's been done well, it went quite differently, and yes, it's not enough really to say. What could be interesting though is actually once this starts running regularly, we can see whether there's regular churn in the survey respondents, or if we have a sort of consistent core of people who respond each year, and then just people who sort of come by every now and then go, so, well, why not I respond to this year's survey? But, we're going to have to wait a bit to actually see how people take the survey. Now, this one's came from a wide range of places. We've got 115 nations represented here. And, and collectively, uh, this one's spent about a thousand hours giving us information. So I think it's funny us from the end of the put into actually giving us this way to work with. It's worth getting at least good efforts to actually trying to extract some value out of these responses. Now, Overall, we found lots of sponsors came from Hanover. No surprises there. But as mentioned, we did not mix around with Hanover. Um, the usual suspects for most of the sponsors, a whole bunch in Europe, a um, whole bunch around Asia, a bit in Australia as well. And yes, there's no sort of nothing particularly surprising here, sort of inline expectations. What I found a bit more interesting though is that we actually normalise the number of sponsors from each nation by the population of said nations, essentially giving a popularity of the maximum release of the maximum respondents for each nation. You end up finding that you, you know, particularly Scandinavia becomes a bit of a hotspot. So I'm not sure what's going on in um, Sweden and in Norway, but it seems to be uh, particularly popular around there. It's also worth looking that we now find that the and, uh, Proportion of respondents in countries like America, Canada, Australia, and most of Europe actually becomes quite um, compatible with each other, which is, yes, once again, sort of lined up with the responses and uh, expectations from the last slide. Okay, and so the other demographic information. The demographic information was new to this uh, survey. In the 2020 survey, it was asked, people asked whether or not they or their income being asked about. Some demographic information in a future survey, and the other one of these ones is sure, I don't really mind. And so that's what we've got here. One of the ones which is of some interest is the age and the weight now. So it expects Emacs to be used predominantly among people in software and programming, and we have a package that is quite widely documented to have about a sort of 75 25 percent roughly. Uh, split between uh, male and female. Interestingly, in Emacs, it's a much more aggressively biased um, result. So we had about 96% of our respondents are male, with yeah, just 4% for the rest. Interestingly, though, if we look at the younger respondents, say for example, under 25, we go from 96% male to 88%. So, as it's fair to say, that uh, the young respondents are, in this respect, a somewhat more diverse group. Hopefully, as future surveys go on, we'll see this um, continuing on sort of die off to the sort of, well, I guess it's sort of more like 99% uh, if you look at the older ages. Uh, okay. We'll see. Occupation was an interesting slide as well. Uh, I'll interesting questions. So, we've got the usual suspects here. I mean, it's a text editor. Well, this uh, machine has really to six that is a main user programming. And so we expect lots of software development and that sort of thing. But it's only about just over half of responses. We've got a huge chunk of academia, and then really just an old bag of all sorts of other things. And those are things which you would really associate with programming and software at all. Things like data writing, publishing, legal, um, yes. And then you've got this chunk of up, uh, which is, I think here, this is the fourth most popular option here. And what you have here is about 500 different sponsors um, from a huge range of activities. It's really quite interesting to read things like, um, I think, I think, like, Mail Officer, uh, and just it's all sorts of surprising 
occupations for war units. Um, uh, I think this is a video that's quite imagined compared to other kind of letters, um, any sort of your piece code and the like, that Emacs may have a particularly diverse set of um, industries or occupations represented in its users. Now, if you look at where the response actually came from, um, we've got the usual suspects up top, uh, I can use the R slash Emacs, but then we actually get a much more evaluated breakdown now in the Twitter survey. Um, we just think there's still many results here, like RIC, Telegram, Emacs, China, but now I'm presenting with a few new entries, things like um, Anyverse, Discourse, Matrix, which didn't pop up previously. So I think this is yet to my side, and in terms of actually hitting a sort of wide range of pockets of Emacs users um, across different platforms, which is both well for the potential representativeness of this survey. Unsurprisingly, if we are talking about Emacs, you know, and particularly people who are quite engaged in it, which are the respondents to the survey, we find that we also get quite a high degree of uh, care for free and open source software. So, if you have a look here, um, only about a quarter of users didn't express um, a strong preference towards FOSS software. In fact, we had over a quarter saying that they would accept significant or even any compromise um, and to use a FOSS um, piece of software over a proprietary alternative, which, uh, given the nature of Emacs, is not terribly surprising, but a strong showing nonetheless. Now, this is the kind of things which are actually useful for potential Emacs development and packaging. If you're talk, thinking about supporting Emacs versions, it looks like you do fantastically well right, in terms of hitting most users. If you support Emacs 27 plus, that, that hits about 96 of respondents. Interestingly though, you can actually make an argument being even more aggressive. I mean, if you have a look at Emacs 28 plus, that's still over three quarters of respondents. And we've got this point a quarter using the unreleased head version, even though it's getting close to release. So, yeah. Obviously here, I say that we're hitting a sort of more engaged with the community subset of Emacs users, but still, I think, as you see, with Emacs is uh, increasingly if we could update schedule, but users are actually picking up those updates quite promptly as they roll out. Continuing on with how people actually use Emacs uh, languages. So we've got the usual suspects here. Lots of Python, like JavaScript and C, lots of shell. What I find quite interesting though is if we actually bring in the 2020 Stack Overflow and usage survey data. And that sort of maps quite well to the array of language options we provided here. The handling or Lisp option, which I've fallen into common Lisp since they listed closure separately, I think that seems like a fairly safe bet. But other than that, the only languages that we missed are Scheme and DLisp. So what we can do is we can look at the relative popularity of different languages from our Emacs user survey compared to Stack Overflow. And what do we find? Well, Closure and Common Lisp far less I imagine in no small part due to the fantastic Slime and the Cider packages. Following that we see Haskell being particularly prominent and then a collection of other languages, your Arlen, Elixir, Julia, um, Pearl and the rest. And then lastly, if we have a look at the ones which have significantly diminished popularity compared to Stack Overflow, we end up with I think what I could probably cast as some more enterprise languages, things like C Sharp, Java, uh, TypeScript, and the like. So that's interesting. Now, earlier on looking at the split of Emacs users, we found that we actually had a Get you in sort of more creative areas like um, writing and publishing. So, if you're looking at prose, we'd expect a decent chunk to be using your know, for prose. But I see more than just a little bit to get to the slice. We've got a whopping about 30 users saying they frequently use Emacs for writing prose. I imagine that the availability of things like all mode and all text probably help like this. Moving on to 
other packages, so more packages that will actually go to a very similar split here to the Twitch Twitch survey. But we can see a bit of a growth in popularity. We've got some new arrivals here as well. For example, Vertigo has popped onto the scene and overtaken Ida here, along with a few other new um, packages like Consult. Other than that, quite compatible. What's rather interesting that I find here is that when you have people who listed a small number of packages, they actually predominantly listed packages that would be the sort of most common site. So if we have a lot of people who listed one package, basically um, two thirds of that, or the, actually three quarters of those responses, were the same other packages. Uh, despite the fact that overall packages other than that part of the selection here only constitute a quarter of responses. So, it might be something a bit more to look at there. Now, when people are using practice, we also ask what types of documentation people would like to see more of um, on package readme's. And so, basically, we want to be mixed here. Yeah. Um, it seems that generally people are interested in seeing more in various forms, whether it be tutorials, overviews, screenshots, comparisons, yeah, old clips and videos. So, Full readme's with a lot of context um, seem to be quite desirable from this. Now, moving forward, what are you going to do? So, 800 people gave some detailed feedback on the survey. That's quite nice. I'm going to be taking a good read of all of those responses and using you know, that to improve the process and also the set of questions. Now, all of you could also get some feedback on the questions. Ones that you found most from this survey, ones that you think might not have much value, and, and or new questions that you think might be a good addition. Once I've done a bit more analysis, particularly the more specific analysis which I'm planning, uh, which will probably come out actually maybe in the first quarter of next year, um, we can see which questions that I seem to have provided most interesting or surprising results, and those are probably worth keeping. Lastly, once we actually have an API and potentially even an Emacs package, we could automate a large number of questions, things like the Emacs version, to the packages to use, and I could just streamline the experience actually for the app to certainly make it a bit more frictionless. Now, talking about frictionless questions, a quick survey is a good survey. Um, if we're asking people to dedicate their time to fill out this, it's good to try to get as much value without asking them to delete much of their time. How's the survey in this respect? I'm actually very happy that's done. We get a few comments from the feedback saying that it was a bit of a long side, but the median time was about 12 minutes, just into Adam, and most commonly we saw people completing it in about 8 minutes. For what's being a survey, I think this seems very reasonable. Getting closer to a sort of 5 to 10 minute range would be nice, but uh, this isn't far enough. Lastly, we really need to look at the, you're also going to be considering how long the survey is open for. So, from the initial opening date, what we have here is a plot of the pages people ended up on and when they started the survey. So, what we can see is a huge spike in the first few days. Um, I've just realized that this plot is actually labeled correctly. Please disregard the minutes to complete the survey. This should be days after survey opening that some response was actually submitted. And what we have here is yeah, big spike of popularity in the first week basically and then it trickles down to a very consistent level after that. I'm about to publish a last call for survey response, so I'll see if anything sort of fun up happens. But I'm just that we could probably actually just have the survey open for a week or two and that should be sufficient. All right, so what's the general plan going forwards? Well, as I said earlier, the idea is to run this annually uh, and then consistently improve the question, the experience, and the analysis that's done. This year has been the hardest way by far because a lot of it had to be set up from scratch. The hope is that moving on from here, a lot of it can be reused. For example, with my comments about more specific analysis being down the line, 
once that's all worked out, as long as nothing changes too drastically, we should be able to reuse a lot of that work quite easily in future years. All right, that's it for now. Hopefully you have found this an interesting peek into how the survey is operated and some of the initial results. And hopefully I'll see you around the next year for the 2023 survey. Thanks for listening.